Hello, this is Real Crusades History, and I'd like to welcome you to our podcast. Uh, today we're going to be continuing with our series of podcasts about the Third Crusade. We've uh, come a long way through the Third Crusade already. We've covered the Battle of Hattin, the fall of Jerusalem, uh, the beginnings of the Third Crusade in Europe and in the Levant, the Siege of Acre, and the Battle of Arsuf. So today we're talk. Uh, today we're taking a bit of a step out of the strict chronology, and we're going to have a look at one specific aspect of the Third Crusade. Uh, of course, the Third Crusade involved battles and uh, military conflicts between the Crusaders and the Saracens, but it also involved this. Uh, these diplomatic negotiations, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. In particular, the famous diplomatic exchanges between Richard the Lionheart and Saladin. For whilst Richard and Saladin sought a military solution to their differences, they at the same time pursued the possibility of some sort of diplomatic settlement. So, my name is J. Stephen Roberts. I'll be your host for this podcast. I have with me today author and historian, Dr. Helen Schroeder. Dr. Schroeder, welcome. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here for this podcast. It's a topic near dear to my heart as a diplomat. This was kind of uh, your idea, Dr. Schroeder, to, to take this angle on the Third Crusade, and I think it's, it's really going to be interesting, so I'm excited to get into it. So, yeah, let's jump right into the diplomacy of the Third Crusade. First of all, we're going to actually jump forward a little bit uh, to the end of the Third Crusade, uh, really to December of 1192, uh, after Richard had departed the Holy Land and he was actually captured by the Holy Roman Emperor while he was on his way back to his own lands. And uh, when this occurred, uh, the Holy Roman Emperor actually, uh, in order to you know, make legitimate what he had done. He had effectively violated uh, this protection of crusaders. Uh, he he brought some charges up against uh, Richard. He sort of gathered this kangaroo court together of his various vassals and bishops. And uh, one of the big charges he leveled against him was this idea that by negotiating with Saladin, he had violated his vow as a crusader. So that's kind of interesting, Dr. Schroeder. What would you say to, to that issue? Uh, it, as you said, he was trying to justify something which was basically not justifiable. So he had to try to discredit Richard as a crusader. Um, his other charges that he'd murdered or had um, Conrad de Montferrat murdered and things like that really didn't get at the heart of the issue. So he had to find some means of criticizing, discrediting Richard as a crusader. What's really interesting and I wish we had the text to this, we wish we had the, the transcript, is that Richard turned that court around. It was a court stacked against him. And Richard managed to defend himself so effectively that basically everybody came out of it saying, they, he was spoken, he was found completely innocent of the charges, and the emperor had to, you know, protect, give him the kiss of peace and, take, you know, oh yes, everything was wonderful and I've been misled kind of thing. So he still held him and he had to get a, find a way and a justification for making Richard pay a ransom. But it was interesting that Richard managed to defuse these charges. And I think we can, we can say that say we don't have the transcripts. We don't really know what he did. But he must have been able to justify his diplomatic initiative in a way that was convincing even to the bishops of the Holy Roman Empire. And I would say that he could do that because he could show that diplomacy was then, as now, um, a legitimate means of trying to obtain objectives. And by the fact that a good general will always try to obtain their objectives with, his min with minimal bloodshed. So if you can get what you're trying to, what you want, without having to fight for it, that's always considered a legitimate tactic in war. Right. Uh, you're absolutely correct about that, Dr. Schroeder. I mean, all through the history of the Crusades, we've got uh, you know, frequent negotiations and diplomatic contacts between the Crusaders and uh, their Muslim enemies. I mean, really starting with the First Crusade. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's just that, that was obviously just a political um, charge that uh, trumped up charge that was being brought up by the Holy Roman Emperor. So, yeah, let's kind of look at, uh, let's go back to the actual Third Crusade now. And uh, 
Now, as you and I were discussing when we were planning this, um, Richard really reached out to Saladin fairly early. When was it? Was it... Uh, d- I don't think we know exactly, but we know f- for certain um, that before our Suf. Before our Suf. And, and I think there are some indications even upon landing in Accra. He, well, first of all, of course, he did negotiate with Saladin about the, about the surrender of Accra and then negotiate with Saladin about him, Saladin, fulfilling the terms of that. So that was the very first diplomatic engagement between the two of them. But we know that, and, and that went very badly, as we've discussed before when we were discussing the siege of Accra, that in fact, uh, Saladin tried to play Richard along and um, basically, Richard called his bluff, but with right. the you know, with the, with the consequences that trust was utterly destroyed between the the sides after the massacre of of the hostages at Accra. So it's significant that Richard, after that, as I say, but before Asuf, probably around September third or fourth, uh, reaches out to Saladin again and asks to meet with him personally. Yes, um, and I know this issue of uh, the fate of the garrison of Accra, you brought that up during our Siege of Accra podcast, and it was really interesting. You, you said that it's almost like Saladin didn't want to take Richard seriously at first. I don't think he did take Richard seriously. I thought, he, I think, well, there are two things. He may have been trying to just string him out because Richard has a campaigning season. The campaigning season ends basically in November. Wars in the, in, in the uh, and Palestine, as I think we've discussed before, basically end when the rains start. So you, you have a limited amount of time. So here's Richard with this hugely expensive army that he's paying, you know, wages to. And he doesn't arrive until uh, June because he stops in Cyprus, which was good and was, it was wonderful. But he doesn't arrive till June. He doesn't get control of Accra until July. So the, the campaign season is now half over. And by stringing him along, Saladin is, you know, winning time and knowing that, you know, if, if, the, snows, if the rains come, uh, maybe this entire crusader army will just disintegrate and go away and he won't have to fight them. So I think Saladin wasn't, you know, just, I think he was intentionally stringing Richard out. And Richard properly realized that if he was going to be taken seriously, not only you know, in future negotiations, he had to show that he couldn't be played with like that. Right. So I do think that the massacre of Accra had a number of reasons that we talked about. You can't take the prisoners with you and, and the morale with the army. The army was angry and, and felt betrayed and they were angry with their leaders for being betrayed. So there are a lot of factors there. But one of them I do think was that Richard felt if he was going to be taken seriously in negotiations in the future, he had to show that he couldn't be lied to and made a fool of. Yeah. So as you just mentioned, uh, before Arsuf on September 5th, Richard sought contact with uh, Aladil, Saladin's brother, for the first time. And by mid-October, after the Crusader victory at Arsuf, they met in person and began negotiations. I'm going to interrupt there. Yes. He, did, he didn't seek contact with Aladil. He sought contact with Saladin. Right. Richard wanted to meet Saladin face to face, probably just to get a measure of the man. Right. And, and, Saladin, and Saladin refused. Saladin says, no, no, leaders, kings don't meet with each other until there's a deal. Right. Which is, which is what happens now. I mean, same thing you have, all the summit diplomacy. Kerry goes out and negotiates, but, you know, heads <laughs> of state don't come together until they have a, a, a finished deal, which they can just put pen to paper to. So... Not unreasonable, although, let me say, Richard was clearly, I think, more interested in just meeting the man, who's seeing who his opponent was. He was used to fighting people he knew well, like his father and brothers, and Philip of France. Um, so he probably just, he probably wanted to know who he was dealing with here. But Saladin rejects it. And instead, he put, he, so it's from at Saladin's initiative to send El Aladil as the negotiator to Richard. Right. So um, a couple of questions here. Um, what was Richard trying to achieve in these negotiations, and what was Saladin trying to achieve by acting through his brother, Aladil? 
Well, Richard's initial uh, request, offer, or what he, his initial demands, he went and asked for, and I love this, the entire kingdom of Jerusalem at its ex- the greatest extent of its borders, which is pretty maximalist, but he went one more and insisted that Saladin ought to actually do homage to the king of Jerusalem, who would then be restored, for Egypt, which, of course, was so far-fetched that al al could only say that was a little bit exaggerated, but we might be able to agree on something more reasonable. <laughs> so, so the idea then, there is to ask for more than you know you can get. To have so room that you for can, Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but clearly, as I said, Richard, we're getting back to as a, as a general, strategically, Richard knows, or tactically, Richard is trying to get what he's come for, which is the kingdom of Jerusalem. So he wants to get the entire kingdom of Jerusalem back, and he throws in Egypt as the, the piece he can negotiate away. Right. Now, it's kind of interesting. Um, Al-Adil, later, he's going to be a serious rival to Saladin in that he ultimately is going to dispossess Saladin's heirs. What, yes. do, you, what do you think about this? I mean, do you think that there's a, there was already some tension between Al-Adil and Saladin at this point, and do you think Richard could have perceived that? No, I don't think that Richard could have perceived it. Let's go back. There, there, there was two parts to that question. Yes. Whether there could have been tension between Saladin and Al-Adil already, possibly, but I think it's unlikely. I think this is mm-hmm. a situation where Saladin was really powerful, entrenched, and Al-Adil's pro- power basically was derived from his brother. Remember, it wasn't their father who, was, who had been the, the powerful man. Saladin actually wins power himself through his coup in Egypt, etc. So he... Al al Dills and the, all of Saladin's family is riding on his coattails. Um, I think, you know, Al al any brothers, there's going to be a certain amount of tension between any brothers. And I'd love to do a podcast on Guy and Amory de Lusignan mm-hmm. and the yeah. tensions that must have been going on there because Amory was so much more the competent of the two and Guy's the one who wears the crown for much of it. So, you know, that, I'm sure there was, there was tremendous tension there. But I think that Al al Dill is not really going to be challenging his brother because his brother is so much the sultan who has taken the family to the heights of power. That Al-Azil becomes a, uh, a rival to um, Saladin's son is because his son is so incompetent. <laughs> and, you know, when, and when you have a situation you, you know, where um, the son of a king who, or comes to a throne and then is alienating uh, your vassals and, and this, the empire is starting to disintegrate, it's logical for the, a more competent older brother to, uh, to step in. English example that maybe people are familiar with is when Richard II comes to the throne. And John of Gaunt basically keeps him in his throne because John of Gaunt, as the uncle, mm-hmm. is so loyal to his dead brother that he doesn't let anybody, not even his own son, challenge Richard II. John of Gaunt dies as a rebellion. At Henry IV comes to the throne. Right. Um, you know, Richard III, again, his brother's young children come to the throne. Country's in, at risk. Uncle takes over. So I, I think that, yes, al al was later does depose Saladin's heirs, but I doubt he was seriously challenging Saladin at this point, although there will always have been sibling rivalries and tensions there that we may not be able to pierce. Richard, however, didn't know them. He had no way of knowing about them. Maybe, you know, it's a pity, it's a pity Don, Stephen Donarchy, Dr. Donarchy isn't with us tonight because he's been studying the, the, um, the barons of, of Jerusalem. And the only way Richard might have learned anything, he's only been in the country three months or something at this point, would have been if the barons of Jerusalem knew a lot more about al al deal and had some sort of intelligence. But I really think that penetrating into the, to the interior workings of Saladin's court would have been beyond the intelligent systems of a defeated kingdom of Jerusalem at this point. I think uh, Aaron Knoll says something about, uh, kind of almost mentions something to that effect, but, you know, at the same time, that could very easily be a matter of hindsight. Well, what's curious, and I think we've discussed this, is that most English seem to us think that Richard initiated the... Uh, the diplomatic suggestion that his sister Joanna should marry Al Al Deal, and if you if you suppose or if you um, contend that Richard made the proposal, you have to see well why would he come up with this contention? How on earth could Richard have come up with this idea that his sister should marry Saladin's brother? 
But, and therefore, people start saying, if you assume Richard made that and took that initiative, why would he do it? Well, maybe he was trying to break Al Al Deal away from Saladin. Mm -hmm. However, you know, we have the testimony, as I, I think I'm trying to find yeah, it we have right that now in the book. We have Baha Adin clearly states that the initiative came from Al Al Deal. Yeah. Um, did you? We've got that passage. I know. Did you want to go ahead and read that? Uh, this is by November is kind of when this starts to happen. Yeah. So, the, yeah. It's the 22nd Ramadan or the 20th of October. Amalek al Adil sent for me and showed us the proposals that had been sent to the King of England by his messenger, al al Adil's messenger, that mm -hmm. is. He said that his plan, we're speaking of al al Adil, his plan was that he himself, al al Adil, should marry the king's sister whom Richard had brought with him from Sicily, where she had been the wife of the late king. Mm -hmm. She would live in Jerusalem, and his brother was to give her the whole of Palestine that was in his hands, Acre, Jaffa, Ascalon, and the rest, while the sultan was to give al al Deal all the parts of Palestine belonging to him and make him their king, in addition to the lands and fees he already held. There's no ambiguity in that. He's clearly stating that the initiative comes from al al Deal, so we don't have to He's trying to fantasize about what motives Richard might have had. Right, and that's really interesting um, because it, it does seem like in terms of popular culture, you know, novels and whatnot, this idea that Richard proposed that has really sort of been entrenched in the popular imagination. But, but yeah, this idea that it, it comes from Al-Adil is really fascinating. I, unfortunately, it's not just in, in novels and other popular culture. There's a number of, of serious historians that talk about this uh, proposal as if it came from, from Richard. And mm. I can only ask, haven't they read the Arab sources? <laughs> or do they think that this was mistranslated or what? I mean, I, I, have not, I do not read Arabic, so I, I am dependent on translation. But the translations that we have are really not ambiguous. Absolutely. Yeah. So let me go ahead and ask you this, Dr. Schroeder. Uh, what do you think al Adil was trying to achieve in this? Was this a serious offer or just an attempt to manipulate the situation? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> not to ask too big of a question. but Yeah, I I'm going to put it this way. It was not a big risk for al Adil to make this proposal because in Arab law, he could be married to multiple women at once mm -hmm. and have any number of concubines. So it would be very easy for him to marry another woman and he wouldn't even have to give up any of his other wives or other women or just reduce the status of one to concubine from wife. And in Arab or Islamic law, he can repudiate a woman without cause simply by saying, I divorced you three times. Mm -hmm. So we get Richard to agree. Richard gives up all that he's conquered. He goes through a ceremony. He sits on crown. The minute Richard sails away, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. And Johanna <laughs> is, a battle, is a woman with nothing. She thrown out on the street. She's no longer into queen. A... She has no one who to protect her. She's no male relative. She's worthless. She's nothing. Yeah. So why not do this? If Richard was stupid enough to buy this thing, they had everything to win. Right. And of course, Richard was never going to fall for something ridiculous like that. What's also fascinating is in the, in, in the, the account, which we were just quoting, mm -hmm. um, when Al Al Deal goes to his brother, the, the Sultan. When, I, when we came to, before the Sultan, I expounded the matter to him, and he read the message in the presence of the men. Saladin immediately approved the terms, knowing quite well that the King of England would never agree to them, and that they were only a trick and a practical joke on his part. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what you might have is Al al Deal making, it, making a bid for saying, look, look, we can try this. I can become King of Jerusalem. And, you know, pr by promising to marry this, this woman, and then as soon as Richard's gone, I can divorce her, and, and we don't have to, you know, once we've gotten this army and this, this dangerous commander who's winning battles out of here, then, you know, we can do anything we want. We can just renege on everything. But um, the terms of it was that Saladin would give him everything Saladin owned. So it was a way for al, -Al Deal to get a wonderful fief. Yeah, it almost, seems like the, it almost seems like Al Adil's first sort of crack at uh, expanding his personal power. Correct. It? Because he would have had from his brother, and where, where he could re repudiate Johanna and get rid of her and get the Christians out by just because by, they no longer have a defender, he would still be his brother's vassal for all of Palestine, mm -hmm. which seems like a pretty good deal to me. And I think the fact that Saladin thought that was a good joke was his way of telling Al Adil, don't think about it. 
I'll right. tell you when I want you to become King of Jerusalem. I think this yeah. is terrible funny. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> great joke. Yeah. So it and almost seems, <laughs> seems like Saladin is kind of mocking his brother's ambition there, doesn't I it? I think so. Yeah. I do. So I guess that, that's kind of, that's, that's pretty intriguing. And, 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 you know, I mean, it, do, it does almost uh, give us a hint of, of what's to come, sort of a little bit of a foreshadowing there. But uh, Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, I know you've brought this up before um, in previous podcasts. Uh, what should we make of Conrad of Montferrat's separate negotiations with Saladin? Mm. During, during this same period. Well, of course, we have to listen what's suit sauce for the goose or sauce for the gander. So if we say it's legitimate for Richard to try to reach his objectives through negotiations, and it's also legitimate perhaps for Conrad de Montferrat to try to get um, recognition as Count of Tyre, which mm-hmm. is what he'd been given in the, in the agreement when they, when they gave – when the, when the and council with Philip and Richard at Acre, they decided to recognize Guy de Lusignan as – king for his lifetime and Conrad as his heir. They had also divided the kingdom, making Geoffrey de Lusignan Count of Jaffa and Ascalon, which they didn't have yet, and making Conrad Count of a new county to be created, which was supposed to be con- supposed to consist of Tyre, Sidon, and Beirut, of which only Tyre was held. So what Conrad's initial approach to Saladin was was to have himself recognized as county of those areas. In other words, trying to get Saladin to give him uh, Sidon and Beirut and allow him to have a, say, viable county which was contiguous with the county of Tripoli, which still existed at that time, remember. Um, And his initial terms was that he would let Saladin have the south if Saladin would recognize his right to that county. Um, Saladin very cleverly countered and correctly countered with the point that you cannot give away what you do not have. So once you have Accra, then I'll talk to you about giving you uh, Tyre, Sidon, and Beirut. So he's trying to turn the Christians against each other. Exactly. So at that point, he's asking Montferrat to actually take up arms against his fellow Christians. And that's where Montferrat really does, in my opinion, show his, that his interests are totally egotistical because he agrees to those terms. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, as long as he was just saying, just give me my peace in the, in the nor- you know, here in the north, let me have my little county and, and you know, Richard can, can get the south. He wasn't supporting Richard anyway. He, was, he wasn't fighting with Richard. So th- the initial offer didn't actually hurt anybody. The sec- when he accepts Saladin's very clever ploy to say, no, no, g- you have to have aquifers. He was agreeing to fight his fellow Christians. And that really does go beyond the bond, bonds of what um, is fair. <laughs> yeah, at that point, he's kind of betraying the cause of the crusade. At that point, so. he's betraying his Christians. Yeah. Not that for, he his own, for his own personal gain. Yeah, not that he would have ever been able to overcome Richard militarily. No. <laughs> certainly not. not. Not, certainly not, but he could have, you know, Richard's fighting in Ascalon and Jaffa, and he could have taken Acre, maybe taken the garrison of Acre, and made Richard's position more difficult, because then yes. he wouldn't have had to yeah. sound the very good port of Acre. So, it's not that he could have beaten Richard the Lionheart, by any means, but he could have made life more difficult for him. Yeah, and he could have, uh, if he'd besieged Acre, he certainly could have dragged Richard back there and made him have to deal with that. Correct. Which would have, Correct. yeah. Okay, so at the end of 1191, uh, negotiations break down between uh, Richard and Aladil, and Richard advances on Jerusalem, then withdraws and seizes Ascalon. This prompts Saladin to ask again for negotiations, but again, this doesn't work out, and Richard once again makes maneuvers toward Jerusalem, though ultimately, again, there's no attack on the city. Now, Richard is the one who reopens negotiations, but these also collapse because Richard will not give up Ascalon. So, Dr. Schroeder, uh, what do you make of this phase of the negotiations? At this point, is gridlock just kind of unavoidable between the two sides? The, the really tragic thing right now is that it is, when I don't have the date in my head, and I'm sorry, maybe you do, Richard gets word somewhere here in the winter um, that his brother John and it's a revolt against him and that Philip of France is yes. trying to take Normandy. So that Richard is now in the, in the really, you know, very, very difficult situation of knowing that his, his inheritance and his, his entire inherit, um, his father's empire and his kingdom is at risk. 
the longer he stays in, in Jerusalem. So he's no longer has the luxury, you know, of dragging this out. Um, and of course, Solomon will know the same thing. He'll have had enough information to know that Richard's under terrible pressure. So from yeah. in the spring on, Richard has to find a solution. He has to get a military or a diplomatic, you know, solution and to the crusade. He cannot go on indefinitely. Yeah, it's really um, striking how brief uh, his stay in the Holy Land was. I mean, imagine if, if he'd been able to stay there as long as someone like Louis IX or something like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. four years or whatever Louis was willing to stay. Yeah. Uh, and again, if he'd been, or had he been willing, I think I mentioned this in another podcast, had he been willing to sacrifice the crown of England for the crown of Jerusalem, and he said, okay, I'm going to make this my kingdom, um, he might have been able to, to he probably would have responded differently, but he wasn't emotionally able, apparently able to give up England and more important Aquitaine for which he'd sp spent the last 10 years fighting. Yeah. Now Richard's negotiations with Al Adil and sort of this, uh, you know, while we've got this, this uh, brutal military conflict going on, we also have this uh, sort of subtle uh, diplomatic exchange taking place. Um, do you think this shatters this popular culture idea of the Crusades? It's just a period of pure barbarism. Well, you know, we never, I never subscribe to that. So. Yes, you and I certainly don't, but <laughs> just kind so, of addressing well, the public, you know. Clearly. What I really think that, that, that again, if you're, a good general tries to achieve their objectives with this minimum amount of, of bloodshed and loss, so that every time you engage in diplomatic maneuvering, it's safe, it's still to achieve your objective. Right. Um, the the uh, Clausewitz says that uh, war is the continuation of diplomacy by other means and vice versa. Diplomacy is the continuation of war. It's trying to get your objectives by other means. Um, and these maneuvers and the fact that Richard the Lionheart, one of the most brilliant generals of his age, was always, and, and from the very beginning to the you know, end, also looking for a solution that did not require a battle, just shows what a sound tactical leader he was. But also strategically, it shows that Richard's keen interest in a diplomatic solution was because he appreciated the strategic context. Mm -hmm. He knew, that, the, as well as we do, that the Christian states, even at the most extensive, were small compared to the territories of their Muslim foes. He knew the Saracens would always be able to field more forces. He knew that the Christian states would always be vulnerable to attack. And he knew, and as soon as he made that decision that he was not going to remain in the Holy Land forever, he had to find some way to settle, you know, make a settlement, to negotiate a settlement that could be sustainable even if once he was gone. And that could only be done by getting the Saladin, getting the Saracens to recognize a status, mm -hmm. quote, recognize something. As long if he just sailed away without, you know, any sort of an agreement, it was clear that, that the Saracens could overrun the, the Crusader states in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. Again, this just to sort of address the popular culture images. Um, in a lot of novels, we sort of get this portrayal of Richard and Aladil sort of forming this almost friendship type relationship. You know, they. They have a common interest in military affairs and horses, and they can kind of get along together. Do you think that's part of the mythos surrounding the Third Crusade? Do you think maybe something like that was possible in the actual history? Yeah, I, yeah, I do think it was possible. We have we have other examples of throughout the Crusades um, where you know people. They, these these were civilized people on both sides. They were educated people. They shared many interests, as you say, riding, haunt, hunting, hawking, um, music. I mean, mm -hmm. there's an instance of things. So that there's no reason why there couldn't have been a certain amount of rapport between Richard and Al Aldil. I don't think you know. As I say, they had they had they respected one another as commanders, as soldiers. I wouldn't over dramatize this. I don't think that means they were great friends or that they were, you know, I think they, they could respect one another and they had certain common interests which enabled them to to talk. And I mean the same you think thing happens now in negotiations. You're always looking for common ground. You're always looking for ways um, to reduce tension by talking about, you know, whether it's the weather or as you say, common interests and and get to the point where you can then talk about the issues at stake. 
um, in an atmosphere that isn't confrontational. Mm -hmm. So that's a natural part of the diplomatic um, game, as I say. But it has nothing to do with with Richard, you know, becoming a great friend of Al Adil. Very interesting stuff, uh, Dr. Schroeder. Well, I'm really glad that uh, you and I were able to do this podcast together. You've got some great ideas on this, and I think it's uh, it's even more interesting because you, I mean, this is your job. You are a diplomat, so that's, yep. that's great. <laughs> and I realize it's a lot less sexy than, than the, the Battle of Arsuf, I know, but hopefully some people will find it interesting to well, think about. I really love the fact that there's these two sides to the Third Crusade, this intense, brutal conflict on the field, but also we've got this, you know, subtlety going on in the in the negotiating room. So it's it just kind of brings this whole other dimension to the Third Crusade. And, and, and it stresses also another dimension to Richard. Richard mm-hmm. also was to prove after the Crusades. He was very, very adept at peeling away Philip II's allies and getting the Count of Toulouse, who he did marry to his sister, onto his side, etc. So this is, uh, if you like, a prelude to what he was to do in the last five years of his reign um, and demonstrated his ability to f- find common ground with enemies, find ways to, um, to, to create, to find solutions that were not purely military. And it's mm-hmm. so much in contrast to, to the stereotypic or caricature of Richard out there that he was just this brutal, almost stupid, you know, buffoon-like, you know, big man out there just hacking at people with, with axes and, and had no subtlety. It's quite the reverse. Absolutely. He was incredibly yeah. adept at trying to find out what, what, the, what the common ground could be, trying to find out how he could motivate people to give him what he wanted or part of what he wanted um, so that his overall objectives could be achieved. So I think even more than the, the idea of the, the ages itself, I think it's a very important aspect of Richard the Lionheart's personality. Oh, yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I and mean, I think uh, Richard, you know, was just as comfortable in these situations of negotiation as he was on the battlefield. I mean, this was he was he was born for this. This was a natural gift of his, as far as we can tell. Mm. And so. Gillingham p- points out that he had a wonderful sense of humor that he used effectively in, in this. And this idea that it was all a great joke, this this proposal with Johanna, but that it was something that he then joked about and they kept, you know, they spun, spun it out a little bit. Right, yeah. <laughs> oh, I yeah. have to talk to the Pope about this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and he, he was a musician. He was a poet himself. I mean, this was a, a very well-rounded, um, uh, advanced sort of individual for his period of time. So... Yep. Uh, excellent. Well, uh, Dr. Schroeder, thanks so much for being with me today. Uh, I do Thank want, you. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I do want to um, remind everybody about your outstanding blog, which is a regular read for me, uh, Defending okay. Crusader Kingdoms. Thank you. And I really enjoyed your, your latest post about uh, Baldwin IV's mother. Very interesting stuff. <laughs> Agnes. Oh, yes. She's quite a woman. Agnes. <laughs> yeah. But I, oh, I also want to remind everybody about my books. Yes. Because um, Envoy of Jerusalem, of course, as the title suggests, does talk about this diplomatic as well as the whole, the, to- the diplomatic aspect as well as the whole thir- Third Crusade. And the book, um, the second book in the series, Defender of Jerusalem, was just awarded a prize. I won the silver second place uh, in Feathered Quills um, Literary Awards 2016 in the category uh, Religious Spiritual. So I'm very, very pleased with that, and I urge everybody to read it. Well, <laughs> Anyone who's interested in the Crusades. Yeah, the, I, I second that. And the Crusader that. Kingdoms. Yeah. I definitely Thank second you. that. I mean, you know, there's so many novels about the Crusades out there, and the vast majority of them are really awful, I mean, to be honest. And, and your, <laughs> yours are great, and I, I love the... Thank the fact that you stay true to the uh, the spirit of the age and really convey, you know, what the medieval world was like, what the Crusader age was like. So, good stuff. Thank you. Um, and I, you've got uh, uh, two of them out so far. Uh, the third, right. are you actually writing the third one right now? The Dr. third Sean? one is almost finished, and I'm still on schedule to bring it out later this year. If I'm Great. lucky this summer, maybe September, if I'm a little late. Good. Well, we'll definitely uh, keep our eyes peeled for that, and uh, that'll be great to complete the trilogy. So, yeah, thanks again, Dr. Schroeder. Great having you. Uh, Next time, we're going to be talking about uh, the March on Jerusalem, I believe. Unless you want to do that tactics first. 
No, no, no. I think we're we're gonna finish out the, the third crusade okay. series okay. definitely, and then after that we'll we'll talk about the Battle of Jaffa and then kind of wrap things up with sort of a final overview podcast. Wait. So excellent. Um, and again, this is Real Crusades History. Uh, you can find us at uh, realcrusadeshistory.com. We release regular videos about the Crusades, and also we do this regular podcast about Crusades history. A new one comes out every first and fifteenth of the month.